Good morning. Thank you for your patience, folks. Um, you are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Uh, we had a little trouble getting our feed to connect to YouTube so that we could start committee, but it looks like we are doing well now. So uh, we are resuming our work this morning on um, S25. And so we have a series of folks who um, would like to share their thoughts on the bill with us. And the first perspective that we're going to hear from this morning is Gwyn Zakoff from the League of Cities and Towns. So welcome, Gwyn, and um, would love to hear your thoughts and reactions to S25. Thank you, Committee uh, Gwyn Zakoff, Vermont League of Cities and Towns. I'm uh, here to comment um, on behalf of the League uh, in terms of what the first provision of the bill uh, contemplates the, in Section 1, the uh, mandatory March 8th by by March 8th, 2023, having uh, all municipalities having a vote whether to permit retail um, sales within their communities. We testified in the Senate uh, an objection to a provision that this, which would had to put it a year earlier, but um, the Senate was uh, thoughtful enough to push it back an additional year to give towns and cities the time to contemplate the rules and regulations that are still pending and won't actually be out until, you know, fully out until next year and even give them a little time to look at other communities um, that have opted in and perhaps are already um, starting retail establishments. Um, so we have no objection to this provision of the bill and support it. Questions for from committee members? Representative LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Gwen. So I'm clear here. So you support that provision that requires the communities to take a vote prior to a certain date? Um, so the, the, we don't object to it. I, I, would, I wouldn't say we fully support it, but we're not going to put any objections towards it. I think the uh, contemplating the fact that um, towns will at that time have had an opportunity to look and see what the rules and regulations are going to be. Um, we'll be able to make a more informed decision. Um, mm -hmm. If uh, towns feel strongly one way or the other, they can um, make that voice heard. Um, it also still leaves the room for communities um, unless there's something great, unless there's a establishment grandfathered within their community, they still have the ability to opt out again. Um, <clears throat> so it's not like all um, they're losing all say in the matter. Uh, I think looking at how towns are not able to uh, vote whether or not to allow growers or other establishments in the community played strongly into our decision to um, sort of step back and say, well, you know, at least if they make an informed decision, um, they can at least have their voice be heard um, later on. And, um, but we just wanted it to be informed. And then in, and when you look at how towns and cities went about doing um, votes for uh, liquor establishments <clears throat> and how for years they had, I believe it was up until maybe the early seventies or late sixties, they had to vote every year <laughs> whether they're allowed to, whether they were going to allow the sale of um, spirits in their communities. Um, it just sort of made sense. Um, so I think it's a, it's a middle ground uh, that we kind of fell onto um, with sort of being okay with this provision. Okay, all right, thank you. Plus for the record here, I get you to testify for a minute and 36 seconds here. <laughs> Must have been the YouTube delay uh, got her off her game. Uh, Representative Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Gwen. So. This is a departure from what was originally passed as far as, you know, you have to opt in. Um, and, and I remember this is years ago, uh, having testimony from Washington State uh, saying that that was, that was a big mistake. I can't remember if they did it and they had a, a real issue with the expense that it cost towns to go through that process. So uh, I'm concerned that, uh, you know, it is a departure from what was originally passed. And I guess maybe a question I've got is, um, so after this date, when towns that don't uh, um, approve or, or disapprove, I guess it would be just approve, um, are, are opened up, how, how is that going to work for uh, a, a business that wants to, are they, 
is it is there going to be an opportunity for the towns to have a dialogue with whatever business it is that's that's going to come into their town even though they haven't voted so you're saying it, if after march 2023 they get an application for a um establishment um after that date how like what what then goes into play right because because again i mean i, I could see possibly you know some uh, businesses uh, picking a particular town, maybe a town that doesn't even have zoning, um, to uh, you know uh, start their endeavor be because of this new provision. Uh, what 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 is the what is the process for that uh, after that uh, 2023 date? Um, I wish I had an answer, but I don't, unfortunately. Um, yeah. Unlike the liquor licenses where the town can get their input put in ahead of time, um, the way this is contemplated for cannabis, we as municipalities won't be able to have our say until after the state makes their decisions and are issued their licenses at the state level. Mm -hmm. So um, the, it, the way the, the rules have been, or sorry, the way the statute has been written um, under last year's bill, got two years ago, whatever it was, <laughs> time doesn't mean anything to me right now. Um, the uh, rules and regulations have to be promulgated by, um, you know, the liquor control board and you folks I'm sure are gonna be weighing in to a large degree. So we won't even know what those rules and regulations say um, to answer your question because other than zoning and even then I'm assuming when you talk about, you know, signage and advertising and and, and perhaps they're gonna put limitations on you know, distances to schools or you know, who knows what. Um, we don't know those rules yet. So I, 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 towns even now who have opted in um, have had questions and we don't have answers just because nobody has answers. So I, don't, I can't answer your question because I don't know what the rules are gonna say. I'm assuming there's gonna be um, sort of a, a, a list of criteria that um, select boards or it not doesn't have to necessarily be select boards because the cannabis local cannabis control board can be um, other folks that the select board puts together. Um, we'll have to look at the rules that are promulgated or that are put forth by um, the state. So it's, we don't, I don't know how that will work or play out. Thank We're you, Gwen. Uh, you know, uh, understanding your, your answer is even more reason for me not, not to support this section. Thank you. <clears throat> Representative LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Well, based on this extensive testimony that you're giving us, um, based on the fact that I'm hearing that the timelines and the fact that their rules haven't even been promulgated yet, would it be fair to assume that you wouldn't have um, an objection to us removing that date potentially? Um, our, our, <laughs> um, our position has always been that we wanted towns to be able to make informed decisions. And so, um, I think the, and, and again, having things moving a little bit slower than contemplated in the S, um, 54 bill from last year, um, it's been a bit of a struggle, um, and it's for towns to actually understand what they're getting into necessarily, um, so I think if the timeline sticks with the way the timeline sticks, where we're actually towns by the town meeting on March 8th, two years from now, that's quite a distance away, uh, that will be enough time for towns to at least make a semi-informed decision. Um, so I think if the timeline sticks, I think we're okay with this provision. I, you know, we wouldn't object to being it pulled out. I think that I think our biggest objection to this entire proposal of, of, of forcing towns to have votes is that it's definitely putting a priority on businesses and establishments um, having some level of certainty, whereas municipalities are not given any. Um, we're definitely being deprioritized. We haven't been given, given any revenue sharing. We haven't been getting any local taxation authority. Um, the committee is very familiar that we have objected to that since day one, um, but we have lost that battle in this committee and in the Ways and Means Committee, even though we've had strong support from the Senate. So I think at a certain level, we've kind of risen our white flag and said, you know, like we surrender, you know, we just be, be thoughtful of our ability to um, have towns be making semi-informed decisions with at least some semblance of understanding what the rules are. Okay. Well, thank you, Gwen. And my preference would be they make a fully informed decision if given the opportunity. Thanks. Uh, thank you for being with us this morning, Gwen. Um, do stay in touch. Um, and uh, if you 
feel that you need to come back and uh, and testify again or uh, clarify anything, don't hesitate to reach out to our committee assistant and we'll get you in. I apologize for running over by 30 seconds, I promise. <laughs> Thanks very much, committee, appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so welcome, I believe that we have Mark Hughes with us, um, uh, the Racial Justice Alliance um, badge on uh, on the, the snooze screen. So um, welcome, Mark. We are taking testimony now on S25. Um, thank you for being with us. Good morning. Mark Hughes, Executive Director of Racial Justice Alliance. Good morning to the committee. Today, you're gonna to hear from uh, a number of members of the Vermont Cannabis Equity Coalition. Uh, Vermont Racial Justice Alliance is just one of them. You're also gonna hear from uh, some folks over at NOFA. Uh, they're gonna tell you some good stuff and they're also gonna um, um, kind of back up some of the things that I'm saying. And, um, and you're gonna hear from some folks over at Rural, uh, rural Vermont. Uh, they have um, similar stories that all of these stories are the same. All of the demands are the same. You're going to hear from folks at the uh, Vermont Growers Association. Um, again, uh, reinforcing this common theme uh, that we're coming to the committee with. And then finally, and hopefully, uh, we've gotten trace on the agenda. And uh, these are the uh, organizations that uh, share um, the, um, the same values and have the same vision uh, on equity uh, in the cannabis uh, industry in Vermont. So I, I think that um, as we have this conversation today, there was a couple of things that I'd ask you to be mindful of. Uh, and, and that one is, is that we are deeply cognizant of the effort that has gone into the work and the path that has led us to taxation and regulation of cannabis in the state of Vermont. Some of us, in fact, have deep historical experiences along this path, just from another perspective. So I, I don't want the committee uh, to assume that our coalition is unfamiliar with the work, the hard work that has gone into bringing us as a state uh, to where we are with Act 164. Second, <clears throat> in this testimony, um, I'd ask that you also consider uh, the fact that the equity piece of this uh, policy um, that we bring to your attention um, is not a new conversation. Um, I think that, that um, that's important to us that you would please take into consideration that we've been moving, as you know, we have been pushing from this position. Um, we, we've been doing so throughout the entire previous biennium and we've been unsuccessful and there has been some level of frustration uh, within the group and within our represented communities. Um, but definitely not a new conversation definitely not a new conversation. So we bring into this discussion all of the testimony, all of the um, support um, and all of the background that went into our work around S54. Uh, we bring into the conversation. Um, I just, just came across my screen something from the Racial Equity Executive Director uh, that, we're, um, that I've yet to be able to really get into. Uh, a previous communication just over the last week or so from Jason Gibbs on their continued support of the work that we're doing and the expectations of the administration, uh, as well as the non-signing statement of the governor uh, and his support uh, for the work that we're doing. So we appreciate, we really do appreciate an opportunity uh, to come uh, before uh, the committee today. And I also wanna acknowledge <clears throat> the um, the chairs and the vice chairs um, effort 
that have gone into this behind the scenes. Maybe some of you on the committee do not know, but they actually sat down with this entire coalition just over the last few days uh, to begin to have these conversations. So that is appreciated. And I think that should be flagged as, uh, as effort and commitment. So thank you, the two of you uh, very much, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I'm going to primarily be uh, talking, and briefly, as you might see, <laughs> on um, the um, just some of the challenges that uh, we continue to have with um, with the equity component of it, as it pertains uh, in this particular case uh, to um, the obstacles for uh, and barriers for market entry for. Um, um, that are presented by racial disparities. Uh, and, and so there's, there's a, um, a policy that you all are aware of, uh, well, that most of you are probably aware of that is, is on the wall, the virtual wall um, call, called H414. And it, is, uh, it was introduced uh, this session. This is a cannabis social equity programs. This, uh, its purpose was to require uh, reduced cannabis establishment license fees for social equity applicants. It, it was also to establish a cannabis business development fund uh, to provide low interest rate uh, loans and grants uh, to social equity applicants uh, to pay for ordinary and necessary expenses to start and operate licensed cannabis establishments uh, and to establish a community social equity program uh, and permit and permit existing licensed cannabis dispensaries to begin selling cannabis and cannabis products in the fall of, I think that might be a misprint in the date there, upon payment of substantial fees and support uh, to support social equity programs. Um, so this um, policy is, is really um, a return of a request that we brought before you last year that it was, it was not in the form of a policy. It may look familiar uh, to some of you. Uh, because it was um, suggested as some of the language that we would incorporate in Act uh, 164 uh, to, um, to clear uh, barriers to market entry uh, for certain demographics of folks. I wanna go now to the policy that I came to testify uh, on is S25 and I just wanna go immediately because my colleagues will be uh, testifying to the various other various aspects of this policy, but I wanted to talk a little bit about Section 11. And in general, uh, I also want to talk about um, just broadly about our approach to addressing uh, equity in this particular policy in, in what hopefully would be the, um, the legislature's um, attitude towards the priority uh, that should be placed in this particular type of work. And one of the words that comes to me is, is, um, is definitely urgency. Um, I, I think that uh, when we talk about a um, emerging market, uh, we know, and you'll hear more testimony on this uh, on equity. What we know is, is that um, market entry and those barriers to market entry, they basically define the market and they also establish um, the precedent upon which folks who are participating in the market have the ability to do so. And what we know, generally speaking, um, and this is based upon our history as a nation, is, is that when we look at folks who are economically disadvantaged, that proportionately, that black and brown folks, now we won't talk about other harm that has, um, has emerged, that has come from this, this weed, uh, in these communities, but just proportionally, what we know is is that you know, and this is just establishing a baseline, that the that black folks, um, when you start looking at our population, you're going to find you're going to find less economic opportunity. In other words, when we start looking at poverty, and this whole testimony, all five of us, is about the intersection uh, between race and class. And this is where this is where we converge. This is where we agree. This is where we understand one another. So this is a very important point here because everything that you'll hear, it it premises uh, in the fact that there are certain folks that just are not going to have as much opportunity to move forward in this market as others when it at its onset. So what that means is, and this is the 
This is the foundation of what I'm getting ready to go into in chapter in section 11. And that is simply that that means that the this in your committee and in the legislature increasingly, this is where we're going to we're asking you to lead. We're asking you to own as much of this as you possibly can, because otherwise it's relegated to an appointed entity. It's relegated to other folks to decide. And that right there in and of itself is problematic because you have the authority and the power to do so. And you also have the language before you to make those determinations and it, and it, it would have an immediate impact. Um, the, the other part of it being problematic is, is when you have another entity that takes responsibility for or not only does that um, telegraph that it's less of a priority for you, but it also relegates that responsibility to someone who may or may not get it done in a way in which it needs to be done all the time while we have the language right here in front of us that could quite possibly uh, uh, be at least part of the solution. Uh, now, in, a, in chapter... Uh, so that, that's the first thing is, is make it a, please make it a priority, make it your priority because it's that important. Equity in this particular bill, right now, it's in your hands. You have the ability to affect change now. And we hope that you signify that um, with you know, establishing this as a priority. Um, the other thing here is, is um, the message that we send to our surrounding uh, states and partners and so forth surrounding the work of equity in, in uh, especially with the emerging market in New York. I want to just briefly go through the social equity um, uh, program here The in it starts with fees in section 11. It, 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 if you get down into the business development fund in, uh, in uh, 986 for those we have the policy 986, it talks about the fund itself. It, it, it does speak to the 3% gross sales made on integrated licenses prior to um, uh, October 15th, but it limits the integrated uh, folks to only $50,000 each. Um, we feel that that is a limitation that's unnecessary. We think that that cap should be higher. We think there's actually another approach that we could take in order to get this done. We're gonna share that with you. It's in H414. The other thing that it says is it, it talks a little bit about um, the funds being used uh, for various purposes. Uh, there are a few purposes that are listed there. We feel that there are other man, there are other things, there are other um, requirements, other um, priorities that these monies could be used for. Um, I'll seek to share a couple of those with you as well. It's also in, in the other policy. I'll refer you uh, to that. The, um, the area over in, in section 13 uh, is, is, and that's the, um, it's on my page 22 or 23, is, is the, um, the Cannabis Control Board Advisory Committee. And, um, and it speaks of its responsibility and consultation to develop criteria for social equity applicants. We've already uh, essentially defined uh, these in H414. All of these criteria have already been defined. Um, we feel uh, that it's a decent definition. It's a, and we feel uh, that the, these definitions could, in fact, be incorporated in this policy now. Um, and in fact, uh, it's our assertion that um, to not do so, and again, it goes back to my primary, my first point, to not do so at this time and place that responsibility in the Cannabis Control uh, Board's uh, uh, purview, what it does is it, you know, it creates the risk that this is just not gonna get done at the level that we'd like to get it done, uh, and, and it, it may miss the mark. And then finally, here I'll talk just a little bit about uh, the, uh, the um, this whole fiscal year, um, this uh, section 14 transfer and appropriation. Uh, there is a fiscal year uh, 2022 uh, transfer and a, uh, and a matching appropriation of $500,000. This, this being an emerging market in, in the state of Vermont and in, in with this particular industry, again, I, I think, um, in, and also in light of the fact that some of this is kind of proverbially being kicked down the road, uh, with the uh, Cannabis Control Board that we fear that it might be too little uh, as well as too late. 
so um, those are the high level overviews. In the last few minutes, I'm just going to take you over to H414 with some solutions uh, to some of these challenges. Uh, what I have here is, is the, um, the cannabis uh, control, the cannabis development fund. And if you have accessibility to H414 and it's in front of you, that would be section 987. If you don't have it in front of you, if you could note, please, section 987. We feel that there's a better approach uh, to uh, implementing said fund. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, to, um, in, in respect for the time that I've been allotted, um, and I'm not gonna belabor you with the details surrounding it, but I did wanna flag it as a solution uh, for an approach, an alternative approach uh, that we feel is more innovative. Uh, and um, the only other thing that we'd flag there is, is with the emergence of the ARPA funding, particularly in light of the fact that there are one-time monies, um, that there might be some creativity that you can backfill uh, some of the um, some of the resources that would be um, that would be um, invested here. The in 988, uh, I will just say that you know this is a clear section 988. This is my page seven of twenty. This this is the clearest uh, definition prescription or um, I would say uh, framework of how this includes, uh, you know, a, a community social equity um, boundary definition. It talks about um, a program board, it allocates their, it assigns their responsibilities. Um, and, and at the end of the day, um, it um, ultimately identifies communities that are in high need, underserved, disproportionately impacted or by historic economic disinvestment or ravaged by violence. Um, so you know, strongly urging that this, you know, this, so, this, this language that defines the social equity program instead of asking the cannabis control board to start from scratch when we have this vital uh, data in front of us, you know, strongly urging that the committee would take into consideration the adoption of this language, uh, particularly in its current state, because it's pretty well fleshed out. Um, and then finally, and in, in almost in closing is, is I did wanna just direct your attention over at section three, um, where there's a discussion on integrated license, licenses. And uh, within that discussion, um, as it takes us to um, there's a there is a um, a clear definition here uh, on how we can leverage the integrated licenses license holders how we can leverage their their background their experience their success. Uh, their economic advantage, uh, and also how we could even incentivize them to pull this market along in a very structured way that's laid out. So I, I'd encourage you to take a look at this language because again, uh, this is a priority. If this is a priority, and I know that it is to you, um, let's and I know we're trying to get this, you were trying to get this thing marked up and voted out by, by, uh, by Thursday. I get it, I see that, I get it. But I think that we're so close right now, committee, uh, on getting the language that we need in this. In closing, I would just say, I, I appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity. I appreciate the willingness and the, the olive branch that the, uh, the chair and the vice chair have held out to us. They invited our entire uh, group uh, to this. Uh, you're going to hear from them more. NOFA, uh, Rural Vermont, Vermont Growers Association, Trace, these people that you will talk to, these are the individuals that I've collaborated with over well over the last year, have grown to be friends. And, you know, I really trust and respect their perspective. And I would ask uh, that as you consider equity uh, in this very, very important policy, uh, that you would hear them and, and let's do the best we can uh, to create the best policy 
uh, to ensure that everybody has the ability to benefit from this marketing moving forward. Thank you. Thanks for being here. And uh, I hope that you can hang out uh, because I, uh, if there are committee questions after we get done with our next witness, um, if we've got time before 10, I would love to have the opportunity to, to ask you some questions. Uh, Representative Merwicki with a quick question. Thank you. Good morning. I wonder if we uh, can get uh, a copy of your testimony. <clears throat> I do not have a written testimony today, um, but thankfully it's being recorded. Um, I didn't. I did not prepare a written testimony, but um, Representative Mariki, I I can prepare some some notes uh, for the committee if if that's if that's what you're getting at. Okay. All right. Thank you for um, that. Thank you, um, Jeffrey Pizzatillo. Thank you for being with us, and uh, we would welcome you to share your thoughts on S twenty five. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, good morning, uh, committee members, representatives. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mark. That was excellent. Uh, good morning to you. Um, and I'll be brief. Uh, it looks like we've got, uh, just to be clear, up until 10. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I'll speak, uh, I just want to introduce myself, um, since uh, Vermont Growers Association might be new to many of you, uh, and, and myself as well. Uh, and then I'll, I'll move over to some policy and uh, hopefully we have some time for some questions afterwards as well. Um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Pistatello. I am the co-founder and executive director of Vermont Growers Association. Uh, think of us as the Vermont Brewers Association, but for cannabis. Uh, we are the trade association for the producers, the retailers, really all aspects of the, uh, of the emerging marketplace. Um, so uh, it's we think it's uh, valuable uh, to have our voices be heard uh, for uh, these matters. Uh, so again, thank you for your time. Um, I've uh, been in Vermont for a little bit. Uh, back in the 2000s, uh, we followed the medical bill. Uh, it, I'm talking uh, 2007. Um, and uh, around that time, I helped bring SSDP to the uh, uh, campus of UVM, uh, if those are familiar with the Drug Policy Alliance that students for a sensible drug policy. Um, so I've been uh, an advocate in this space for a while. Um, I've been a registered caregiver in our Vermont Marijuana Registry uh, since it's been operational in 2007. So I'm well aware of uh, the ins and outs of that state program. Uh, I've been growing cannabis for uh, a couple decades. I'm a professional cannabis grower. I consult in other states. Um, and that's a little bit about me. Um, about Vermont Growers Association. Uh, we formed in March, 2019. Uh, and, and really uh, uh, our first four way into uh, the legislature was in January, 2020 uh, when uh, uh, S54 was being discussed. Uh, and um, you know, we had amendments such as um, <clears throat> doubling the uh, canopy size for the craft cultivation license from 500 to 1000 square feet. That happened. Uh, that was a major win for the small producers. So we thank you uh, for um, working on that and getting that done last year. Um, speaking to uh, S25, moving over to policy, uh, I wanna touch upon some of the um, activity that happened in the Senate uh, back in February and over the past uh, couple months. So we do have some proposed language, uh, our Vermont uh, Cannabis Equity Coalition uh, and hopefully you guys have those documents in front of you. Um, but specific to S25, um, if you do have that in front of you, I just wanna comment that in section two of the bill, there are a couple provisions that uh, we are grateful that the Senate has adopted in the bill. Uh, and I just wanna bring them up and reinforce their importance really quickly. Uh, that would be um, the provision four under section two, which is the removal authority for the CCB uh, that gives the advisory committee the uh, opportunity, uh, if need be, to hold accountability over the Cannabis Control Board. We think that's important. That came from lessons learned in other states. It's just inching towards a little bit more accountability in the regulatory agency. We would like to see that persist in the law or in this bill. Uh, moving on, uh, the other uh, provision that we have under Section 2 is uh, 
under provision H, which is for the advisory committee, we had uh, asked that um, Senate and GovOps include a 13th member of the advisory committee to reflect medical patients' interests. The unique challenges that patients have uh, need to be represented in the regulatory agency to some extent, since we are all aware that the CCB will be uh, in, uh, managing our uh, state medical program. Um, so uh, we asked that um, that 13th member be defined as someone from the ANA Vermont or a uh, medical professional who is aware of the unique patient challenges. Unfortunately, that 13th member, it turns out, was defined as someone from the Vermont Cannabis Trade Association, and we would like to see that fixed. That was not our original intent. We respect the Vermont Cannabis Trade Association. We think that they have a role in this industry, but the intent of that 13th member was not to give it to industry representation. It was to give it to patient representation. So I just want to make that clear, and we would like to see that change happen. Um, moving on to uh, some of the larger points that I'd like to discuss with you guys this morning. Uh, and that surrounds licensing, licensing, licensing equity. Uh, licensing equity is very important. Why is that important? Um, it's commonly said that one of the primary barriers to entry for small businesses, small producers is capital. That is a concern, but putting aside for a moment, the unique characteristics of a social equity program and social equity applicants, Capital financing is not the primary barrier to entry for small businesses. Money is not the primary barrier to entry to small businesses. It is licenses and what we call license equity. And that's incredibly important that as an adult use marketplace rolls out and we see this in other states that we don't need a fully defined mature marketplace on day one, but we need to have license equity across the board. And so we achieve that by our proposed language uh, through what, we, what, what, what we're characterizing as a craft license tier. So the craft license tier, uh, we took um, very much the intent of 164, where they start defining this craft license tier vis-a-vis -vis the craft cultivation license. And there's actually, if you guys look, there's a provision that says the CCB shall determine a craft delivery craft. So there, they allude to building out this sort of craft structure. We do that now. Um, we do that now. Uh, and we also apply costs. Um, and why is that important? That's important because uh, let, me, let me refer to actually, and, and by the way, thank you for having Chair Pepper on yesterday. That was incredibly insightful. Um, and I'm going to refer to some of his comments. Um, Yesterday, Chair Pepper mentioned that uh, some states, similar to Vermont, took their time, did a very uh, enacted a, a very great, you know, very nice bill, uh, very thoughtful. However, when it came to rollout implementation and formation, it sort of fell flat, and and we didn't see the successes that we were intending in our legislation. And so, I want to I want to consider some of those states and look at some of those uh, issues and and how they've gotten past them really really quickly when it comes to licensing. So uh, Chair Pepper had mentioned Massachusetts. Massachusetts uh, passed a similar bill to S54. Uh, and after about uh, three years of their market, they found themselves with, uh, for the most part, uh, an inequitable licensing uh, uh, outcome, which was not only was there uh, an, uh, a negligible amount of social equity applicants that actually had uh, businesses operational, but the ratio from corporate uh, actors to small business actors was inequitable. Uh, what Massachusetts found was they had no issue with capital, but they had hundreds of small businesses waiting in line for their commission to assign them licenses. So licenses was the issue. And so what did, what did Massachusetts do to rectify that? One of the things that they did, well, specific to social equity was they took the time to provide uh, funding and technical assistance that their social equity program did not have. So that was specific to um, bringing some of those applicants to market. In addition to that, for everyone else outside of the social equity program, they defined new license types through their legislative body. Some of those license types are 
accessible delivery licenses. And that in and of itself was seen as bringing greater equity to the marketplace. That allowed small businesses who were having trouble obtaining licenses for whatever reason, uh, obtain, uh, ha have access to um, the market through a more accessible license type. So they course corrected through adjusting their license type and their licensing structure. So what this craft here uh, that we're proposing, you guys adopt in S25 this year, uh, not only uh, brings a uniquely Vermont licensing structure to our state, but it also, which is really important we think because of the significant delays with implementation, it helps repair some of this process that we're undergoing right now. Case in point, two of the primary, uh, I wanna say um, provisions that uh, Chair Pepper um, stated were required this year were advertising and licensing fees. Licensing needs to get done this year. And that's more than just costs and fees, that's including Vermonters in a more robust, accessible licensing structure. Now, I wanna be clear. We don't want cannabis to be treated like a tomato plant, okay? We think that there needs to be smart, mindful regulation. So no one in our coalition is asking for the wild, wild west here. What we do recognize is smart, meaningful, mindful regulation if it meets the interests of the residents and the small businesses of the state can help transition the legacy actors which are currently operating in our state. Let's be clear, we've got a robust cannabis marketplace right now, it's underground. We wanna bring those individuals above board. And I do believe that was one of the original intents of S54. A licensing structure will do that. And I wanna conclude because I wanna be mindful of time in case you guys have any questions. And I just wanna end by saying, Look at what New York State and other states are doing around us. Um, if we don't get this right, we will lose our talent. We will lose our talent. I, I, I wanna share with you. Um, we've heard from farmers, producers, retailers. They don't see themselves in terms of a licensing structure yet in this law. And that speaks to confidence, that speaks to um, assurances and certainty in business development. In adult use marketplaces, businesses cannot get going until they get their license first. They cannot get going until they get their license first. The dispensaries have that, have that assurance in, in, in 164 and that's fine. Their licenses are defined for them. They have that insurance. Again, we think they have a role in this marketplace. We're asking you to value Vermonters and include them at an equal footing in statute this year so we can get going as quickly as possible. We can bring certainty and assurances to our businesses so they're not thinking about maybe going to New York State where they see more approachable licenses offered to them right now. So things to consider. Um, I, I, I had a little bit more to share about um, what some other states are doing. Um, we've been studying state cannabis law for over a decade. Um, so more than happy to, uh, at some point, uh, you know, be invited back or share some of our uh, insights or resources about what other states are doing. Um, and I'll end by saying that uh, our coalition represents really the intersectionality of cannabis. Um, and something that uh, Chair Pepper had mentioned yesterday, when we start talking about cannabis policy, you ultimately start talking about every corner of state government. Cannabis, the plant, uh, is the fundamental intersectionality of so many things. That's what our coalition represents. So it's important to have racial equity, agricultural equity, equity, the economic equity that we're talking about through licensing structures all occur at the same time. We think that it's possible. We think we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We think that the uh, work that the Racial Justice Alliance did with H414 is a fantastic starter for bringing equity to the marketplace. We think that the craft licensing tier that we've developed is a fantastic starter. Um, I thank you for your time uh, and uh, happy to take any questions that you guys may have. Thank you so much for being here. Representative LeClaire has a question. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for testifying, Jeffrey. Um, you, you referred to this a couple of times, this, this craft licensing or craft growers. 
Could you just briefly elaborate on what, what you mean by that? <laughs> um, specifically with regards to our proposed language? Pardon me. <clears throat> um, well, uh, in 164, um, you guys had defined a uh, craft cultivation uh, license type. Uh, and also in uh, 164, uh, there are, uh, there is language that says to be determined, let's, let's maybe fill out this craft structure. Uh, there's language that says uh, craft delivery and whatnot. Uh, and so um, Vermont does not compete in terms of commodity. We compete in terms of craft. So where we're positioning ourselves in terms of that craft definition is, um, we will see federal sooner rather than later. Okay, so we will have a, federal reg a, a federally regulated uh, marketplace, probably, hopefully in Biden's first term. We are positioning Vermont to be able to export our high quality craft product to other states. We have 8 million residents beneath us in, in New York State. I'd much rather have us uh, be in a primed location to export a craft product when we're able to, than have to uh, spend that time to then work up to that point. Uh, so really, it's a race, uh, and uh, the sooner we can sort of define uh, and build out a craft sort of marketplace, a cottage industry that represents or reflects our beer, our, our cheese, our maple syrup, the better. I hope that answers your question. If not, I'm happy to elaborate more. Okay. Um, thank you. Representative Anthony. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you for uh, your testimony. I'm um, concerned, as are you, in uh, trying to avoid the Massachusetts initial result anyway, which is a, a highly concentrated group of, uh, of folks uh, who are holding the licenses. <clears throat> and, and I'm wondering not just about the initial award of licenses or the number, or the identity of the initial holder, I'm sort of thinking about the next iteration in a historical process, which I'll uh, liken to the standard oil business model, which is to say, just go buy up a bunch of licenses and create essentially a pyramiding uh, structure of integrated, but nevertheless subservient uh, people who are growing or shipping or packaging or marketing uh, but the uh, the head head honcho, so to say, is holding essentially a clutch of licenses. So how do we stretch out if we can never present uh, prevent over say fifty years? How do we stretch out that tendency for uh, the licenses to become concentrated? I'm thinking of transfer, uh, sale, uh, time uh, dimensional. Uh, hurdles, uh, sell it to a fellow Vermonter, I, I don't know, but I just worry that it's not only, the problem is not only the initial award universe, it goes beyond that. And, and I sort of want to think as you do, so what happens 10 years from now? What will it look like? And try and anticipate some of the uh, less desirable tendencies that, uh, for which there's lots of historical uh, analogs. Thank you. Thank you, Rep. Anthony. Uh, fantastic question. We have considered this when we were developing the craft tier, so I'm happy to provide an answer for you. Um, a couple things. Uh, Oregon and Massachusetts, uh, so they ran into similar scenarios. So in Massachusetts, how did they deal with this? First of all, they did not have the excellent consolidation parameters that you guys worked into 164. They did not have that. So we have a, a leg up on that. We learned that lesson. That's fantastic, but that's not the silver bullet. There's more to that equation. They also did not have accessible licenses nor production caps. So what that allowed was that allowed exactly what you detailed was the pyramid scheming, the large players that we feel are inappropriate for certain states. Okay. So right now uh, in 164, we don't have production caps. We should expect uh, at least the three uh, corporations that operate in our state and our medical industry to develop, to build 30,000 to 50,000 indoor facilities. 30,000 to 50,000 square feet indoor facilities. 
That is factory farming. That is able, that is technically legal right now under 164. We think that is wholly inappropriate. Uh, you uh, diminish that interest in uh, corporate uh, desire by uh, uh, doing a couple things. First of all, we've got uh, market consolidation parameters. Secondly, you impose production caps. We are asking uh, through our craft license tier that we impose statewide production caps. So that would be indoor capped at 10,000 square feet. We've got a mixed light rate. So stepping back for a moment, the way that we define cannabis cultivation is what's through a, a, uh, a plant count ratio. This is what other states do. So what does that mean? That means a one to two to four ratio for indoor, mixed light and outdoor. So for every 1,000 square feet indoor, that's 2,000 square feet mixed light, 4,000 square feet outdoor. You cap production by canopy size and that severely diminishes the desire for companies to come in and invest in your state, these large out of state actors. In addition to that, you do not have limited licensing. Limited licensing allows corporations to value those licenses more and sell them to one another and, and consolidate. We're seeking a rolling uh, application process with production caps. That's what creates a safe marketplace, a well-regulated marketplace, and a small business-centric marketplace that is not so desirable for these what, what are called MSOs or multi-state operators. And again, we have three, three of them in our state right now. All right, so committee, any questions for either Mark Hughes or Jeffrey Pizzatillo before we uh, sign off for the morning? Or uh, not for the morning, but for a break. Wishful thinking. Okay, um, thank you gentlemen for being with us today. Um, thanks for sharing your thoughts on S25 and um, do feel free to send any follow-up um, uh, written testimony or, uh, or bullet points to our committee assistant and she will get them up on our committee page. So thank you so much for your time this morning. Have a good day. Committee, we are on break until 1030 and we have a pretty heavy, meaty um, topic to dive into at 1030. So do please uh, try to come back uh, on time so that we can get right started. Thank you. See you all in 25 minutes. <laughs>